Welcome, I'm Mia Parrish. I'm the head of media, ASU Media Enterprise, and this is our latest free speech project conversation. The free speech project is a year long inquiry of Future Tense, which is a project of ASU, New America, and Slate Magazine um, that we're doing in collaboration with American University's Tech Law and Security Program. Future Tense is holding a series of events throughout the year looking at how technology is affecting and challenging our traditional free speech, legal, and cultural norms. And we are publishing articles as part of the project on Slate every week. I'm joined today by Suzanne Nossel, who's the CEO of PEN America and the author of a forthcoming book called Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. It comes out in May. Uh, it looks fascinating. I'm already, I'm, I'm in. Um, PEN America has also been a great partner with us on a number of these free speech projects and events and Suzanne spoke at our kickoff event at American University back in February. Very glad to have you. Um, also with us is Kyle Pope. He's the editor and publisher of the Columbia Journalism Review. He covered media and television at the Wall Street Journal um, a time ago as well as having super relevant and interesting experience running hyperlocal uh, papers in Metro New York, and he also edited the New York Observer for a time. This is, as we have said again and again, a really vital time for free speech and free expression, um, not just in America, but around the world. And an informed citizenry and a vigorous press are um, vital to holding the powerful accountable. And this has long been a hallmark of New American democracy and is integral to our right to free speech. But as more and more communities mm -hmm. have the collapsing business model um, come in on them and create con create trouble and controversy um, for them to be able to have their robust role in the community. We're seeing a cascading effect in traditional media business models and COVID-19 mm -hmm. has highlighted the importance of us having a robust free press um, at the same time as really uh, causing a lot of financial issues um, and is creating a crisis for those ever shrinking newsrooms across the country. I wanna thank all of you for joining us as we consider the future of the news business and the possible remedies to the threat that could prove devastating to our democracy. Um, and a reminder that we will be taking questions. You can log those at the bottom. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I thought, Kyle, maybe you could uh, sort of set the stage for us and what's going on today and what you're seeing as an um, observer and a reporter, um, educated, knowledgeable person on this. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the state of the local news business was bad before the coronavirus arrived. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about pre-existing conditions and vulnerabilities and this is an industry that was very 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 sick um, before any of this happened and um, I'm I'm sorry to say that I think it's just going to decimate uh, the local news landscape across the country. Um, at CJR we do a lot of reporting on this, um, we compile a lot of data and I got to tell you that um, pretty much a day is, doesn't go by in the last couple of weeks where we don't get an email from somebody saying I'm a, I'm a member of a staff of a paper, they're laying off people, they're cutting our salaries, they're discontinuing our operations. So it's very, very widespread. Um, and I just fear that it's going to accelerate. So um, there's, for us, there's sort of two projects. One is chronicling that and understanding the depths of it and how widespread it is and how many people are affected and what it means. But then we really have to start thinking about what is the what is this business going to look like? And and, and I don't think it's it's not going to reconstitute itself as it was. We're not going to see um, a newly vibrant commercial landscape of for-profit local newspaper. That I think is over. So the question now is is what is the what do these models look like? Who's going to fund them? Um, what kind of help is going to be needed? We at CJR have have already started running um, sort of op-ed pieces by people. One, one piece was sort of proposing a, a journalism stimulus program, similar to the stimulus plan that Congress has passed for the overall economy. Um, other people are talking about, you know, sort of a, a rallying cry for philanthropy. But um, I think for us, uh, it's going to be the defining story sort of going forward once we emerge from this sort of terrifying healthcare crisis that we're in right now. Right. Though it is related, you know, the terrifying healthcare crisis is causing 
I, I, I liken it to it is a patient who already had all the underlying health conditions and totally. now is infected with the virus, right? Totally. So it's I mean, it, it was, this was not a blow that uh, this industry could withstand. Um, mm -hmm. It was already um, teetering and, and, you know, a lot of these outlets were really just trying to hold it together. And it, this is just going to prove to be too much. Mm -hmm. Hold that thought because that is uh, central to to the question of you know what is it that we're going to do about it as well. Um, I thought Suzanne could weigh in on you know you're, a, you're an expert. You've spoken internationally on free expression and free speech, and in this time where we're having um, certainly a lot of misinformation, but also cries for you know maintaining free expression in that, um, what do you see as the big challenges and how is Yeah, that? sure. I mean, maybe I'll just say a word about how it is that PEN America became involved in addressing Ab this issue. Absolutely. Yeah, so we are a membership organization of writers uh, all over the country, united in defense of free expression. And after the 2016 election, we, evolved from being kind of a New York centric organization to really mobilizing our membership across the country. And we now have a network of chapters. And as we did that, press freedom concerns were uppermost in our mind. We were worried about Donald Trump's attacks on the media, his threats against journalists. And we were concerned that there wasn't really a constituency in defense of press freedom in this country that ever had had to be mobilized because, you know, we don't, you've been able to kind of by and large take some of these freedoms for granted. They were encroached upon uh, to some degree, but this was an unprecedented attack. But when we went across the country, you know, what we found was something quite different. And uh, I'd say the concerns we heard overwhelmingly were much less about President Trump and his attacks and denigration of journalists and far more about what was happening at the coalface in these local communities where they had seen their newspapers be where they closed down, uh, decimated, becoming what we call ghost papers where there's almost no original local reporting and everything in there kind of comes from somewhere else and is stitched together in some instances being taken over by hedge funds or large corporations that were essentially milking these businesses, taking out as much cost as possible, shrinking down uh, the reporting staff to skeleton levels, and the sense of alarm that we heard around the country about you know, what was being lost as local news was disappearing, you know, the ability to hold officials accountable uh, to be informed, to you know, foster community uh, across different subcultures, uh, for minority communities to have their concerns aired and heard. And so we put together a big report called Losing the News that we issued last November, kind of chronicling all of this. And we, we looked at three in-depth case, case studies on Detroit, Denver and North Carolina. And we also examined, you know, what are the solutions here? Can these business models be reinvented? Uh, you know, what, how far can the role of philanthropy go? And we really reached the conclusion that there's a $35 billion gap in terms of lost revenue in this industry. And that to make that up or even come close, it's got to be kind of an all hands on deck approach. We do need uh, a much more robust and up-to-date uh, approach to public funding. And, you know, that really this represents a crisis for democracy if we allow these local news outlets to get to wither away. And I think the COVID crisis, you know, one silver lining is it's just made the essentiality of local news so manifest and undeniable. You know, when people need to know what stores are open? What precisely are the local regulations? You know, where can you get uh, a test for coronavirus? Like these very basic elemental needs that citizens have, uh, you know, amidst this pandemic, local news outlets are fulfilling. And we, we think of, 
local journalists really as, as first responders. Like they are, mm -hmm. you know, and they have been, journalists have been designated as essential employees just about everywhere. Right. So we talk about the grocery store workers and the police, but it's also the journalists who are doing this vital work, putting themselves mm -hmm. at risk. Yeah, no, it's really interesting how, um, it, it, you know, it literally is listed as an essential operation, which it is. It's essential to the uh, to our health and safety and, you know, the, the knowledge and security in that. Uh, yet we're also having a crisis of people not wanting to pay for that. I've seen so many, you know, a lot of the operations have dropped their paywalls and there's some controversy around whether that's a good idea or not. And I think, I don't know what Kyle's opinion is on that, but um, in the response to this, we're not seeing a ton of people jumping in to say, you're right, I really need to support local media, you know, they are seeing it and needing it, but, um, you know, well, I, they weren't, <clears throat> they weren't doing that before this crisis. Right. Um, it's been very hard for local media to make the case for, uh, paid subscriptions. Um, the wall street journal has been able to do it. The New York times has been able to do it. The Atlantic has been able to do it, but very, very, very few local outlets across the country. I mean, I totally agree with what Suzanne's saying about how this highlights the critical nature of what, these reporters do. Um, and I think that's going to be even more the case once we emerge from the sort of the, the, the current immediate health crisis, because um, then we're going to be, you know, then there's so much reporting to do. I mean, the amazing thing about this pandemic is it's sort of shown a spotlight on all of the problems in our society and in our, in, in our life that we knew were there, but we didn't know the depths of them. So whether it's like, what is the state of readiness of our local hospital or what, what has been going on in our local jail or how equipped was the local school district to handle uh, remote learning? I mean, these are all stories that are national stories, but they're all replicated in mm -hmm. towns and cities all around the country. And, and just the, the, the desperate need to understand sort of how we ended up in this place. I mean, forget Trump and, and what he did. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of local work to be done to figure out what the impact on each community has been. I think, um, you know, just in terms of thinking through, I mean, this gap that Suzanne mentioned that their report surfaced, um, you know, there, there's basically nobody that can fill that. Um, there's, no, there's no foundation big enough. Um, there's no um, collection of hedge funds that are gonna have enough money. I mean, ultimately this is gonna come down to us making the case that local journalism is a necessary public service. And that um, just like the water department and the EMS and the fire department is. And you know, whether that, you know, what that looks like, it could look like some kind of public private funding. It could look like um, some kind of um, philanthropic support in the community, or it could just look like um, a sense of obligation for people who live in those towns to say, this is important to me and it's and as we've learned in the recent months it's important to whether i live or die i have to help pay for this it's incumbent on me to support these places um that is the only place where we're going to be able to make up that kind of gap if people if, if, if there is if there's a public spiritedness around how important these outlets are because there's no rescue big enough that's going to come in from the outside yeah have you seen um a an example of where that's worked? I mean, there are some internationally, probably what The Guardian has done and some others where there's been more movement toward that, but the, the market doesn't tend to operate with um, public interest as a motivator, no. you know? There's, there, there are, um, um, you know, there are examples around the world. I mean, um, um, The Guardian is interesting. Um, um, I mean, it's a national newspaper, but they actually have a, there's a lot of people who buy Guardian subscriptions and give them as gifts to other people, which I find interesting. Um, and it sort of gets to the point that we were just making. Um, there have been cases around the country. New Jer there was a group in New Jersey that was really looking at, is there a way that we could add a small tax um, that would then be used to fund local journalism? Obviously, it's very problematic because do you really want the government involved in administering this? But it was more of a thought experience, experiment, I thought, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there have been other cases where just sort of local community leaders have decided, uh, you know what, um, having 
a good local outlet is important to us is having good parks and a good public education system and a good local theater. So we are going to like put our money where our mouth is and sort of support this and we're gonna rally other kind of prominent local people to do the same. That, that has happened in some communities. Um, so we just need to be seeing a lot more of that. Ms. Suzanne's um, made the point about the ghost papers and more than 2,200 newspapers have gone out um, of business in the last five, eight, 10 years. You're gonna see more and more of them. They're, they're still continuing to be, um, uh, you know, they're going dark or they're going to, they're more like ghost papers. That's happened with TV stations as well, where you'd see that commoditization of news that's built out of New York showing up in Des Moines or whatever. It's, it's not just a newspaper issue. And uh, we're, now we're seeing that accelerate. Obviously COVID's gonna, there are a variety of newspapers have gone to two or three times a week in print or not at all. And, and that really exacerbates and accelerates that problem. Um, are you seeing, what are you seeing, Suzanne, out there that is, um, is helpful or, you know, and, and I'll just share one of my frustrations where I've in this, um, you look at the comments on the stories and people are saying, uh, you know, why are you charging me for this? It's essential. And I'm like, I charge, you get charged for the doctor and water and your gardener wants to be paid and all sorts of people want to be paid. And it's an interesting conundrum to me that it's so vital it should be free, <laughs> but it's um, but it's so important and it actually costs money that people don't see the value in it. So I'm curious. Yeah, no, I think there's things. still sort of a, a you know a hangover from the days where you know everything on the internet was free and people expected it to be free and it was seen as an entitlement and information should be you know unchained. I mean, we are dealing with on a separate front, uh, you know, the Internet Archive, which has. Uh, you know, declared for itself an emergency license to all sorts of books uh, just to disseminate them uh, freely without any copyright royalties back to the author. So there is still this idea of an entitlement. And I think, you know, many local news outlets, as you touched on, have decided to drop paywalls in relation to COVID coverage as a matter of civic duty and public service. And I think, uh, you know, that's honorable and the right thing to do, but it just doesn't answer the question of, you know, how on earth are we going to muster the resources to continue to produce this vital information? And we see reports, there's now a tracker uh, day by day of whether it's layoffs, furloughs, pay cuts, uh, cuts in print distribution, that are being announced by local news outlets, you know, day in and day out. I mean, this was really sort of a perfect storm in that, uh, you know, the business model that, you know, was destroyed and has eroded so sharply, you know, was, was uh, one that hinged on advertising and some of the remaining sources of advertising that, you know, these even threadbare publications were still reliant on, of course, are retail stores, restaurants, event businesses, all of these outlets that have, you know, themselves been absolutely slammed by our national shutdown. And, you know, they're, uh, you know, uh, working on fumes right now because they don't have revenues coming in. And of course, they have no need to advertise. And so it's this very difficult kind of confluence of circumstances. I'd say the one you know, I, I try to be an optimist. I think, you know, one thing that uh, gives me some hope is that this issue is finally getting some attention. I mean, when we started out on this topic, I'd say, you know, over a year ago, I mean, Kyle was an expert and there were experts in some of the uh, journalism schools across the country who were looking into this and doing uh, important data collection and reporting, but it was not a mainstream stream topic of conversation. And just today, I, you know, I think there's an illustration of how it is breaking into wider awareness. There were two letters that were issued today. One was uh, by PEN America and a consortium of other groups, including Common Cause and Free Press, about 45 different organizations uh, writing to Congress to ask that local news be addressed in the next stimulus package. Uh, and the second, on a very similar theme, was uh, a group of more than a dozen senators led by Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut uh, calling for the exact same thing. And so, 
you know, there is more momentum and, you know, we can talk about what the pitfalls of public funding are because I think it has to be done very carefully. And, you know, it was not our, our thought when we entered into uh, an examination of this topic that PEN America would ever come in, out in favor of public funding for journalism or that as, as part of a, a major part of the solution to what ails local journalism. But uh, it was apparent to us, given the size of the gap, that it, it has to be uh, part of what it has done to shore up this sector uh, a, a, in its essential role for our democracy. So, mm -hmm. you know, that bit of momentum and attention, you know, uh, I, I do think is important. Obviously, we have to see it through and make sure it leads to action, and that's not going to be so easy. Right. You're seeing a lot of challenges. Um, you know, obviously, the in the past, the idea of government um, having anything to do with, you know, real journalism was anathema, but you're at this true crisis point where all these questions are having to be asked and, and experiments are being done in Canada and other places, but you know, we'll see. Well, and let's also remember that it's anathema in this country, but it's right. very common in other parts right. of the world, especially in Europe, where uh, and we know the model that the BBC has, um, but all over Scandinavia, there's public funding models and there's, you know, there, there are people doing very good work there. So it's not like this is something that's completely, it's, it's not like it's a completely unheard of idea. Um, there are people who are doing it every day and doing it well. Mm -hmm. No, I, and, and the, the news outlets at the moment who were really seeing some increases in uh, traction uh, have been public media. So NPR and uh, public television are actually doing pretty well right now. And I think some of that has to do not so much with the, the government support, but having had a different diversification of the revenue model all along with membership and sponsorship and other, they've been able to uh, be more stable and not as re reactive perhaps and able to invest. Um, so there's, there are, we do have models of you know, government funded or supported mm. um, real credible journalism now. So it's, not completely crazy for us. So, um, are you, one of the other things that I think has been interesting has been the, some talk about Fox News and whether or not they should be held accountable in terms of the misinformation space and what that looks like, especially in light of the virus. I wondered if either of you had thoughts on that. And that's another thing, you, you suing the media has not been something that any of us were interested in doing, but that's starting to burble up um, with this crisis. That's been a new thing as well. I'll put that over to Suzanne. Yeah, I mean, look, it's not- <laughs> A free expression question, right? You know, yeah, it's like- it is. I mean, it's something, you know, it, it, you know, our general view, we've done a lot of work on questions of misinformation uh, and fake news. And, you know, the vast, vast bulk of it is protected under the First Amendment. And, you know, we support that. We don't think the answer by and large lies in banning or punishing it. And we are very concerned about the, you know, the thin lines that can separate, uh, you know, whether it's hyperbole or uh, political hoo-ha, uh, you know, or just the heated rhetoric uh, of a vociferously waged campaign from actual, you know, fake news. And so uh, it does concern us to embolden, empower the government to crack down uh, in silence. And, you know, I, I think the danger is particularly vivid, you know, if, if uh, you know, you imagine sort of prosecuting news agencies right now, you can imagine who would be on the receiving end of that, and it wouldn't be Fox News. Now, you know, that being said, uh, well, I don't let's, know let's that... by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt, but let's remember that the president has sued um, the New York Times and CNN already. So mm -hmm. he's already yes, gone down in this his, room. In his, in his personal capacity, which I, you know, I, I think is outrageous. And to me, intuitively, uh, you know, is, is just totally inconsistent with the First Amendment, although a First Amendment lawyer will say that he can do that in his personal capacity uh, because he's not, um, you know, it's not an action of government, but it obviously carries the weight of the presidency for him to, uh, you know, seek to retaliate against whether it's a book author 
or uh, a journalism organization for the content of what uh, they've written. But you know, a, a private lawsuit, you know, I think it's a question of whether there's any sort of cause of action. I mean, if you can prove that you know, this is deliberate, willful dissemination of misinformation uh, and uh, you know, medically unsound information that, that is contradicted by the uh, internal uh, guidance that was circulating uh, within the news organization for their own employees. Uh, I don't know if that rises to the level of a cause of action. I think it does raise concerns, but I think a lot of it will hinge on you know, whether that standard of willful deceit uh, yeah, and reckless endangerment can be met and whether, whether the evidence will substantiate that. You know, I think it's more in the vein of, you know, these things are debatable and, you know, different scientists are saying different things, you know, which has been true throughout a lot of this pandemic. Uh, you know, I think then, uh, you know, regrettable, irresponsible, you know, but not illegal. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they're going to have to answer to their own viewers. Um, a lot of whom are quite are older. It's an older audience, and they're very vulnerable. And there are going to be people um, who are going to suffer as a result. So I think you know the. Um, um, I, I mean, I'm less forgiving of them because I think you know it's one thing to, to. De I mean, a lot of this stuff that they were spouting wasn't debatable. It was just it was fantasy. So um, I, I think there's going to be a, a you know. This could finally be the thing that where they have to pay a sort of commercial price, which I think is why you're starting to see members of the Murdoch family, for instance, sort of step up and say, well, maybe we maybe this went on too far. I think they're starting to be afraid of that. Yeah. There's I... also a question of their advertisers. You know, uh, how can advertisers sort of stand by this, you know, as we learn that, you know, there were there was different guidance being handed out uh, internally. There were people who were uh, aware of the facts and, and, and recognized that what was being broadcast was inaccurate. You know, obviously the, the, the picture is complicated by the fact that, you know, we have the, the, the misinformation purveyor in chief at the White House podium day in and day out talking about unproven scientific treatments and mm -hmm. Uh, you know, containment measures that haven't been implemented, uh, you know, that he says are working perfectly. And so, you know, the whole kind of quality of our discourse is degraded by that and people become inured to misinformation. So I don't have enormous confidence that the viewership of Fox News is going to, you know, stand up in rebellion. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we we would all be better off if people did hold, you know, both leaders and new groups organizations accountable for accuracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it's important for us to have responsibility and culpability in some of the decisions that have been made and some of the outcomes that we've seen, both on the business side and in on the new side. You know, that's um, you know there are different extremes of that, but we're seeing a lot of that play out now in ways that are perhaps unfixable. Um, and really disturbing. Well, I also think it, I think it's related to this, the subject that we were talking about earlier, which is how do we get um, people to rally around the importance of local news in their community? Mm -hmm. And if, if they're being told by the large, most watched cable outlet in the country that, um, that a lot of journalism is fake and that, um, you know, reporters are, are um, out to hurt the country, it makes that, it makes that case more difficult. Um, um, which is why, you know, the president's, you know, it's easy to dismiss the president's rhetoric as, as a political um, stump speech, but it, it is insidious in that it does, it does trickle down and in, into um, local communities around the country. I mean, the New York Times can defend itself. Um, but you know now we're at the point where um, much smaller places in, in if some of them in, in parts of the country that support the president are going to have to make the case that we need your support and his actions and Fox's actions have made that case more difficult. Yeah, I mean a couple points. You're absolutely right that we see, you know, I think kind of the Trumpification of our whole society and this. Uh, 
impulse to punish people for speaking out, you know, Ron DeSantis uh, excluding a reporter from a news briefing in Florida because they dared ask about social distancing, uh, you know, in the press room. And so we do see this kind of pattern of copycat uh, dismissiveness and contemptuousness toward the press. You know, that said, you know, the surveys show that citizens consistently trust their local media more than they do the national media. And, mm -hmm. you know, they believe that these reporters who they see within their own communities uh, are more connected and, and, and more uh, uh, truthful in their coverage. And so that, you know, is a kind of shred of hope, uh, you know, if we want to rebuild uh, an information in ecosystem where people, you know, know where to turn for factual information, local news should be a centerpiece of that. And I think in the COVID context, you know, that's being borne out and people are really, you know, they are seeing that this essential information about how to sort of go about your life under this crisis is, is coming from these local outlets and that they're a lifeline. Yeah, seeing uh, some of the stories now that pe people were believing that the media was overhyping um, early in the coverage when that's just, we don't overhype, we just report what's happening. And so now the reality of what's happened has caught up. And I think in this case, there's so much that is coming true that we were sort of told by some outlets wasn't going to be true, some individuals and outlets. Um, and that, that's been a bit of a sea change because typically it's like a story in a place versus the story everywhere. Um, so sort of the preponderance of that is different than what I've seen um, in my career previously. I think that we may see kind of a, it might be something of a sea change, but it might be too late to Kyle's point because at the same time that we've had this hit on the economy, it's been a gigantic hit on advertising. That's a huge element. So it's hurting this other business that's related to the business that we do as well. And yeah, I we think, were talking a little about the business models and other things too, but. Yeah, you're seeing a real, um, it's, be, it's devastating the uh, alt weekly landscape. I mean, those, those outlets depended on uh, live events for a big chunk of their advertising um, and restaurants and basically everything that you do when you're with people. <laughs> um, right. Music, been, luncheons, been, everything. Yeah, that's <laughs> completely now uh, just has sort of been taken out from under them. And you also, frankly, seen a little bit of opportunistic cutting where I think you had some outlets that were not doing so great and, and, and were... Um, especially that are owned by sort of investment groups or who sort of seize on the opportunity. I, I mean, I thought very quickly, it was like, oh, well, where are we going to happen into this? And they're saying, well, we're going to cut way back. So that was clearly in the works already. Um, but um, it's just going to become, I mean, it's like everything that we're living through right now. We, we, none of us know where, none of us know where, where, where the other side is. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know where the other side, I live in New York City and, and every day I sort of look for glimmers of hope in the data and some days I see it and some days I don't. And I'm trying to sort of think about, you know, are we going to, you know, are my children going to be back in school or what is the, you know, and we don't know anything. And I think um, we have to get through that phase first and then we can start like looking at, um, at the, at the battlefield and sort of say, where do we go now? Mm -hmm. So what, is that, what does this phase look like? You've got a, a situation where, like you said, we don't know where it ends, how long it's gonna take, what that looks like. Um, the things that we've done in the past really haven't been working. And the, the things that we lean on for revenue are gone. You know, how do you build that trust? What could that look like? Suzanne mentioned that trust is up with local. That's a, the latest Gallup poll. The credibility of local news operations has increased in the um, most recent polling. But is there a, are you seeing some green shoots of hopefulness or silver lining in any of this? I mean, my hope is that the, some of the stimulus money, whether it's uh, local news outlets that are independent and can apply 
for small business administration uh, financing, you know, or a more structured scheme, uh, hopefully to address this sector, you know, that's a, that's a bridging move. That's a stopgap. That's something that, uh, you know, we hope will prevent outlets from going out of business entirely because once they disappear, they do not come back. And so there, there's a finality uh, at stake here, you know, just over the next couple of months during this, um, you know, extraordinary period where, uh, you know, we, we, we may well see news outlets just shut, you know, closing their doors permanently. Um, and then once we get beyond though that, kind, you know, this kind of crisis phase, it, it really is, uh, you know, the hope is, you know, as we sort of start to look at many facets are of our society, like, you know, for example, the, the, the health disparities that are leading to some of the grave gaps that we're now learning about in terms of who really is hit by this disease and how hard uh, in terms of different minority populations within cities. You know, my hope is that the, the precariousness uh, and essentiality of local news is, uh, you know, another great societal revelation that emerges from this. And we have made the case for, you know, that, that local journalism is a public good and that we need a congressional commission, uh, you know, in the style of the original Carnegie Commission that uh, led to the establishment of our public broadcast corporation to re-examine the support that we give uh, and bring that whole system up to date so that we can provide some uh, permanent long-term sustenance to these organizations shoring up the role that they play in our democracy. We think it needs to be done very carefully and that we need to be looking at models from around the world in terms of how editorial independence is preserved. There are also models in the scientific arena with research funding uh, in the art sector and humanities sector where with the, the very substantial funding that goes to U.S. universities. So, you know, we think there's a way to do this and that, you know, perhaps this stimulus phase can kind of destigmatize the idea of expanded public funding and uh, catalyze uh, a, a robust, in-depth debate and examination, you know, that will take place going forward. That, you know, that, that I would say is, is the hopeful scenario. Yeah, I'd agree. We have, um, we have a couple questions, so I thought I would hop to those. Um, the first is from Gordon Skinner, and he asks, what about having the press and journalism as a public utility? You know, we've touched on that sort of, um, and why not have it be a public benefit corporation um, and not be underwritten by the government or be a privately held business? So the idea of a, a B Corp um, idea, I know, Kyle, you've written a little bit about various business models that might make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think that's, these, these things get bogged down very quickly and, um, and tax issues and legal issues. But I mean, I think the idea is sort of right. Um, um, there's already, I think there's some legislation, and Suzanne probably knows more about this, uh, in California that enables for-profit media to um, create nonprofit arms so they can collect um, that kind of yeah. funding. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, I mean, even, you know, even the New York Times is doing that now. I think they're, they're, um, they're, they're creating some sort of nonprofit arms yeah. to fund foundation. Specific, yeah, mm -hmm. to fund foundation reporting. I mean, to, to allow for foundation funding. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think those are the kind of kind of creative um, approaches we got to be thinking about. I think, you know, there is a there is a risk that a lot of what we're talking about, these are really big ideas. They're going to take quite a while to unfold at a time when everything else in American society is being rebuilt at the same time. So I do fear that some of this stuff isn't going to come soon enough. Um, so I think, you know, we also have to be thinking short term about what can news organizations do today. I mean, one of the things that you're starting to see a lot more of uh, is just cooperation across outlets. So this idea that we're all kind of competitive with every other journalistic outlet in the country is I think a, um, is, not, is not the way to look at the moment that we're in. So um, you're seeing now a lot more 
um, you know, uh, ProPublica has been doing this for a long time where they cooperate with local news outlets and, and NPR has been very good at kind of stitching its stations together to do reporting. But, you know, we, we got to be looking at, you know, the, the LA Times and the local newspaper in Texas and a local newspaper in, in Illinois and the local TV station in Florida all working together on a story that they have common interest in and sharing and pooling resources. Um, we at CJR had been, we, we grew frustrated about a year ago um, with the lack of, uh, of, of adequate coverage of the climate crisis. So we decided that we were going to try to put together a collaboration of news outlets around the world and with the goal of everybody doing more and better climate coverage and sharing their content that they had. Um, and we didn't know what would happen. We didn't know if people would be into it. We were trying to get competing organizations to be part of the same collaborative and share information. Um, it's called Covering Climate Now. And now there's um, 400 news organizations around the world, including competing, like there's Reuters is a member, as is Bloomberg, as is AFP. Um, they're all in the same business, but they've recognized that in order to really move the needle on this stuff, they have to work together and they have to share. So um, I've been really encouraged by that. I mean, that seems like a million years ago that we launched that. And mm -hmm. it seems like, um, you know, people are focused on, on different things, although I would argue that there are, there are a lot of crossovers between the corona story and the climate story. Um, but it does prove that um, news outlets can work together and collaborate and sort of um, have an impact that, that they can magnify. I think you're seeing, I'm a strong believer in collaboration and partnerships, and I, I don't think that the TV station down the street is um, my enemy. Like, mm -hmm. I think, you know, there are a lot of other bigger enemies or threats, like Facebook and Google having most of the digital advertising. You know, there are things that are um, more detrimental to our operations um, than being able to partner with the TV station or the NPR station in El Paso or, you know, figuring out ways to get the coverage that you need, whether they're one of your cousins and your company or not. You know, your example is the LA Times and others who are independents, which I think is a really good example. Um, someone also asked about nonprofit news and the nonprofit model. There is, you know, one newspaper is the first one out in Salt Lake, which has that nonprofit status that they um, had uh, gotten agreed to. There are a couple others that are dabbling in that space. Um, I've tended to say that that is not a solution. You know, it's part of a solution. It's not a magic bullet because you still, even if you're a nonprofit, you still have to figure out how to fund <laughs> journalism. So it is that, you know, they're not suddenly also not taking pay. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing. To that point, we have a, another question um, from Bruce Gaber in Bethesda, Maryland, who says, um, I'm fortunate enough um, to have been looking at ways to creatively spend my recovery money. Um, how might we spread the idea of contributing some of this money to support local journalism? And you know, certainly we encourage people to uh, subscribe and I've been subscribing like crazy, you know, and it's, it's not a, a ton of money, but um, what other things have you seen where that's been? And you talked about the foundational money going in to, to support some journalism, but other things that you all have seen answering Mr. Gaber's question. Yeah, I mean, I think one point that uh, Bear is mentioning is, look, there has been this huge philanthropic infusion of $300 million over the last few years uh, into journalism. And some amazing organizations have, uh, you know, been brought to life with those resources like ProPublica that are doing extraordinary work and they're partnering with uh, leading media outlets here in the U.S. and around the world and, and breaking vital stories, but a, a, a comparatively uh, very small percentage of those resources really are going to local media uh, and, and, you know, this part of the market. And, you know, there are all kinds of reasons for that. It has a lot to do with how foundations work. They're trying to change it. You know, there are new projects underway. They're trying to push those monies uh, out to the grassroots, um, you know, but as you say, it is not a panacea. First of all, you know, even if the most robust and rosy projections of how 
that philanthropic investment might grow just doesn't come anywhere. You know, you're talking about third, 300 million and 35 billion. You know, the numbers just don't add up. It's never going to be a way to compensate uh, and keep alive the kind of local news infrastructure that we are accustomed to. Uh, so I, I think it's very important. I think, you know, one piece that, it, uh, you know, particularly we would like to see is more connective tissue within individual communities so that local philanthropists uh, and citizens recognize the value of local media and celebrate that value and support that value, you know, potentially not just as subscribers, but as, uh, you know, where, where nonprofit uh, entities and arms have been set up as, as supporters and, and donors uh, as well. And that's something in the communities where we work creating that connective tissue and often, you know, the, while the data on trust uh, is points in the right direction and levels of trust of local media are high, there also are all kinds of disconnects and uh, misperceptions about local media. People don't know a lot about how the news is made. They often don't know, especially younger generations, they don't know the individuals who are behind it. So a lot of the work we've been doing is sort of building up that connective tissue so people understand and, and recognize these local news organizations as vital institutions within their community that they engage with, that they support, you know, the welfare of which they see uh, as a matter of public concern. Well, and it's also incumbent on these news organizations to humanize themselves. I mean, we did a story, um, and now it's been a couple of years ago, but there was a paper in Pennsylvania um, that was in a, um, where, where most of its its readership base um, voted for Trump, and they kept they they after the election they started getting well, you guys are fake news you guys are fake news, and they decided um, instead of just arguing with these people they actually sort of invited them into the newsroom and said hey come on in um, we'll show you how we work you can meet our editors and just get a better sense of how we operate um, and what was interesting is that when they first put out this call. Um, Nobody took them up on it. So they sort of upped the ante and said, okay, we'll buy you a pizza. Like, we'll, we'll pay for your lunch if you'll just come in. Um, and, and ultimately, people did. And they had this, they had a really interesting conversation about like, you know, they asked the readers, why do you think we're fake news? And they would say, well, you ran this headline that said, you know, Trump and Clinton. Uh, and and, and the, the local people were like, that was an AP story. Like, we didn't write that story. That was a wire service story. So can you point us to something that we did that feeds this belief? And so there was sort of slowly a kind of breakdown of this kind of mistrust um, that, that still existed there. So I think, you know, um, it, it, it's important for sort of leaders in the community to take this on, but it's also important for um, the news outlets themselves. I mean, one other little story I was, um, uh, you mentioned that I, I ran a sort of group of hyper local papers in, Manhattan for a little while and we decided we wanted to do the same thing so we like um, <laughs> like it's sort of a crazy idea but we we got an RV and we parked it on the sidewalk on the uh, in Manhattan and we basically said this is the office hours for the local newspaper come by the RV and chat um, one problem Love was it. that we didn't clear it with the cops that we were going to say this. did you have a <laughs> We quickly surrounded Whoops. by NYPD saying, what are you doing here? But, but once we sort of sold them on the idea that it wasn't terrible, um, and people lined up, and you know, people came, and they, and they brought stuff and um, gave us ideas. So, um, I mean, I do think that there is, it's incumbent on us to make, to make it clear that, we're, that we don't stand apart from these communities that we're mm -hmm. in that were in these communities. Yeah, and people want to feel connected and they want to feel like they belong and they, they want, they have pride of place and we should too, because we're, we're serving them and um, being, you know, reminding people that we're their neighbors and their family and friends too, and what that looks like. And that requires some vulnerability and humility too. I think that you're seeing more and more of it. I had a, a student introduce me to his aunt and uncle, um, an event not long ago and the uncle said I remember you you actually answered my email when I emailed uh -huh. you a question about circulation and I'm like absolutely I did but not everybody does and it makes a difference and he remembered that from from years ago 
Um, we had another question about, um, have you seen local publications that have successfully bridged the digital divide? You know, we, people talk about this being, oh, you know, if they were only digital and that, that, that as you know, we know isn't the answer, but um, have you seen local ones that have done a good job of that? The national players, obviously, the yeah. Times yeah. In, the Wash, in the Wall Street Journal, which was very early to the paywall game, but. Um, I mean, there's, um, um, the ones that I'm most familiar with are, um, have a sort of different funding models. I mean, the Texas Tribune in Austin does an amazing job. It's, that, that's a purely digital publication, as is the city, uh, which is a fairly new publication in New York um, that covers local news really, really well. Um, I mean, I got to say, like, um, the, the number of, of examples of what were traditional local, especially independent uh, print publications that are, that are now thriving digitally, it's a very, very small number. They're, you're not seeing, I mean, even the pure, pure play digital properties are struggling and having to do layoffs. And, you know, even some of the digital darlings because they're supported in the same way that the traditional media are by and large. And right. That's made it really yeah, there's just a struggle. this obvious problem of scale. You know, the, we, the mm -hmm. way that the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal can do it is that they uh, you know, offer a national product. And so even mm -hmm. though the advertising rates are, you know, so much, and the subscription uh, prices are so much drastically lower than it was back in the days of print, you know, they can make up for a lot of that on just sheer volume by offering a national product. But if you have only got sort of the universe of Seattle or Dallas or Des Moines, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to work with in terms of who would be interested in the news that you're producing, you know, those numbers just don't add up. And we have seen, uh, you know, Seattle Times and others, you know, innovating Dallas Morning News, uh, you know, and doing creative things and having some success and traction, uh, you know, with particular strategies and approaches and offerings. And I think, you know, there are other ideas afoot about uh, trying to make local marketplaces and, you know, access to the kinds of very localized vendors, whether it's for weddings or funerals, uh, you know, easy to reach through local papers, building on, you know, some of the services that, you know, outlets like the Wedding Channel provide, but making it happen at a very local level you know, it, it, it hasn't fully manifested and whether it can and it will, you know, remains a big uncertainty. Nobody has cracked this. If they had, I think we would see that that model replicated all over the country. Mm -hmm. I've seen some really uh, interesting stuff out of the San Francisco Chronicle, just sharing where they focused very intensely on conversion and what kinds of stories convert people to paid subscribers. Um, focusing particularly on digital, those digital subscribers and that using that data to really help um, that, uh, you know, understanding of what it is that people are looking for and what makes them loyal to the experience, I think is really thoughtful and smart using the research, the data that you have and the behaviors of people um, to help deter make determinations about how to build that connectivity. Um, that question was from Michael Elling, and I have one more from uh, Jim Loving asking, um, from a public policy perspective, has this challenge made it to the radar of the U.S. Congress or any state houses? So what are you seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned this earlier that, uh, you know, there's just, just this letter that was put out today by about a dozen Democratic senators talking about the importance of channeling stimulus monies to local news. And that's getting a fair amount of coverage today. And so, yes, there are folks in Congress who have become seized with this issue of late, you know, I'd say, uh, and, and COVID is helping with that because they, you know, both because they recognize the value that local news is providing and also because of the intensification of the, of the pressures on local news and the kind of manifest shedding of jobs that we are witnessing. And yeah, we have seen 
some uh, signs of life at the state level. I mean, New Jersey, uh, Kyle touched on, and it's, you know, it's sort of a, a, a bit of a sob story. Uh, you know, it began as a huge initiative to channel some spectrum licensing revenues that had come to the state uh, toward local news. And it was going to be, uh, you know, over $100 million. And just over time, you know, this very ambitious kind of visionary proposal for how to shore up local news got whittled down and whittled down. I think now, you know, there's maybe one or $2 million left that, uh, you know, potentially will be used for that purpose. And so I think that's, you know, one of the hard things here as, you know, the essentiality is obvious to us and it seems particularly evident, you know, at a moment of uh, national crisis and the health crisis that impacts localities very differently. But we're not used to paying for this. We're not used to prioritizing it. It's sort of not on the list alongside, you know, education, uh, healthcare, and sort of the, the voting issues that, and the pocketbook issues uh, that people uh, center uh, in how they think about our politics, how, how politicians think about budgets. So it's, it's an uphill battle to sort of notch a position uh, that local news is a public good and that we actually need to take money away from uh, you know, other public benefits and services in order to underwrite this. You know, that's, that's a tall order. Uh, you know, I agree with Kyle, you know, it may be a long time before we make significant headway. I, I do think it's a debate we have to have because there is no other solution and we should uh, capitalize on the momentum we have now where there's suddenly some more interest and recognition of this problem. Right. Um, we just have a couple minutes left and, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, perhaps what glimmers of hope are you seeing or what, uh, you know, what silver lining in this as we've talked a lot about the focus on or that COVID is putting a focus on this and how important it is. Um, Kyle, you've been looking for, for that. What, what could you? Yeah, I don't have, I don't have <clears throat> as much, um, hope right now on the on the model front my my area of hope lies in um journalists sort of individual commitments to sort of tell these stories i mean i can't tell you how many pitches we've gotten from people who said i was laid off yesterday and i want to do this story today um i mean there, there's you know people are uh, i mean i i i expect that we're going to see what we saw after the 2016 election where after the 2016 election, you saw a surge of people applying to go into journalism, college journalism programs, just because they felt a yes. calling. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling we're gonna see the same thing now. So that is great and it's heartwarming, um, but we just have to find a way to pay these people's salaries. And we, did, we have seen a bump, a Trump bump in uh, admission to journalism schools and mm -hmm. Cronkite has its largest class ever, you know, that came in this past fall. We, um, a, a sort of fun and heart, heartwarming thing. One of my colleagues posted yesterday on Twitter asking journalists something that they love about their job. And I was really loving reading that thread because like you said, there's still so much heart for the work mm -hmm. and dedication to the mission under some really, really difficult situations, you know, whether not just pay cuts, you know, you're, you're reporting from home, you're you know, the economy's going crazy and there are a lot of things that are making that harder um, to do the work and there's a lot of pressure in that. And they're also out on the front lines reporting and putting themselves in harm's way. So I would agree with you on that. Um, Suzanne, any last thoughts as we're wrapping up? And Yeah, I guess, you know, a hopeful thought is that the public also mm -hmm. uh, becomes sensitized during this crisis to the essential role of journalism. I think it is a moment where the idea of holding our public officials accountable, I mean, the way this has gone down in this country, both at the national level and local level and delays and mistakes that were made that have cost lives and affected families and communities in uh, such a profound way, that there's a sense that you know, telling, unearthing, digging up these stories, holding these officials accountable, uh, you know, allowing people to know why it is that, uh, you know, their family member, uh, you know, lost their life because a lockdown wasn't called earlier enough or they were not aware 
uh, of a, a piece of the risk. So I, I have some hope that people's interest and belief in journalism will be stoked by this crisis and that, you know, that too uh, will help fuel and find a solution. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank both of you, Suzanne and Kyle and everyone who tuned in today, which means you actually care about something that's really vitally important to all of us, but certainly to the three of us. Um, the Free Speech Project, as I said, is a year-long inquiry uh, with Future Tense, um, which is a project of ASU, New America, and Slate Magazine in collaboration with American University's Tech, Law, and Security Program. Um, we'll be holding additional events like this, and we really appreciate all of you and your interest and your continuing support of a free press, free expression, and democracy in America. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.